Hey guys, Jordan with the Young Turks and TYT Politics. It is uh, mon- what's today? Monday, uh, and it is uh, pretty cold in Standing Rock. I apologize if this live stream goes dead. Yesterday I tried to go live, but it is so cold here that the cold literally zaps the battery and the phone off. So I'm going to try to stay live as, as long as I can. Right now it's 4 degrees. Wind chill feels more like negative 10. Um, I just wanted to do a quick report here. I'm at the main Osheti Sakoin camp uh, here at Standing Rock. Uh, this will be my last day at Standing Rock. I'm going home to New York for a few days, and then I'll be going to Texas to cover the uh, Trans-Picos pipeline there. Uh, as you know, I've been to Standing Rock five times. Uh, my last, tri- my current trip here, I've been here three weeks. So it's a, it's a bit of a bittersweet thing to leave, but the Young Turks will be sending another uh, reporter uh, to cover Dakota Access Pipeline as I go. So we'll have it covered uh, even without me here. And of course, I might be back. So we'll see what happens. Let me know if you guys can hear me well. Um, my hand is holding the monopod and I'm a little cold but I'll try to make it louder if you can't hear me. So I wanted to get across a few things uh, to you because the mainstream media and even a lot of independent media has left. Um, If you could see, let me flip around here for you. Uh, The camp has emptied out quite a bit. Uh, I'm not going to bullshit you about it. Uh, The camp is, I'd say, half, half as full as it was before. Let me try to zoom in for you. So that's the camp here, Osheti Sakoi. Uh, across the river there is the Rosebud Camp. There is the sun beaming down on me. Hopefully that's a good sign. And uh, back to me. So camp's about half full. I would say uh, you probably have at this point about a thousand people left. Um, most people obviously have left because of the severe winter conditions. They were not uh, well equipped to be out in the cold. They were here in summer tents originally. Um, and unfortunately, it's very difficult uh, with blizzards coming uh, rapidly. There's already been two blizzards in two weeks here. Uh, it's very difficult for everybody to winterize and get in heated tents all in a span of two weeks with the blizzard. Uh, that have been coming. Uh, It's also been very dangerous because as the blizzards are coming, the Morton County Police, Governor Jack Dalrymple, still have uh, a blockade in place just above the camp on the bridge. They call it Blackwater Bridge. They still have this uh, blockade in place. So if people get sick, if people get hurt, if people get hypothermic, uh, they cannot get straight to Bismarck. This main road, 1806, allows people uh, from here to get to Bismarck in about 45 minutes. Bismarck would be the nearest town. Uh, Mandan slash Bismarck would be the nearest town if you need uh, medical attention or, you know, a hotel or whatever it is. Only one hotel here. So people who have been sick, people who have needed medical attention uh, to get to the nearest city for food, for shelter, it's been very difficult. Um, There are still... As I said, a thousand people here. And when I interviewed them the last two days, I said, you know, everybody, everybody outside of here thinks that this issue is done. They think, oh, the permit was denied for uh, the oil company to drill under Lake Oahe. So what are you guys doing out here? And it's really um, it's really striking to me because uh, Native Americans, the history of Native Americans, the history of this country, uh, as a white person and as white people watching, we we might understand it, but we've never had it done to us. Um, They don't trust the government. They don't trust what President Obama says or what the Army Corps of Engineers says. Yes, it was a small victory, uh, not yesterday, but the Sunday before that, when the Army Corps uh, declared, said they will not grant a permit for them to drill under Lake Oahe. But uh, Native Americans here, a lot of the non-natives that are still here, uh, they don't trust that uh, they're not, the company won't drill under the lake. And they uh, essentially feel, you know what, the minute we leave, the minute uh, there's nobody here to stand for the camp, to stand for the water, uh, that's when they're going to go ahead and do it. And they will end up just, you know, drilling under the lake. Trump will become president and they'll pay, you know, a couple, uh, you know, maybe... $50 $50 million fine or something like that. So the Native Americans staying here now and the non-natives staying here, like I said, my best guess is there's probably a thousand people here. Uh, they are here because they are basically the watchers. They are watching what the oil company is doing. Uh, when I asked them, do you guys plan on continuing to do take action? Uh, like you saw here the last few months, there was pretty much demonstrations, actions against the police 
uh, against the police, against the oil company just about every day. Uh, they said, yeah, they, they plan on doing that. But you should also know that December is a global a global month of action against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Uh, I can't I can't read you the information now because I'm live, but I will put the links for the information uh, under the video once we put this video on TYT Politics on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed, youtube.com slash TYT Politics, 136,000 subscribers. Can we get 150 by the end of the year? That's up to you. Help us, support us. So... Um, there's a global month of action, so this you could go to actionnetwork.org, I believe it is, and you could find where there's actions in your neighborhood to stand up against the Dakota Access Pipeline. There's also the ongoing bank divestment um, initiative. People like Susan Sarandon, other activists, have been pushing hard for people to divest from the banks that are investing in the Dakota Access Pipeline. Even with the permit being denied, we have not heard of Wells Fargo. We have not heard of Bank of America. These other banks, I think there's uh, at least uh, 15 to 20 banks big name banks that are invested in the Dakota Access Pipeline. And that's not just that's not just American banks, that's Swedish banks, Norwegian banks, uh, foreign banks as well. So the question is, why are these banks still invested in a, in a pipeline company that has been denied a permit to, dr to drill in North uh, under a lake? And the company says it plans on breaking the law. It plans on drilling anyway. Why are banks? Why, why do we have our money in those banks that say they are going to invest in a uh, law-breaking oil company? That's the question. And we all know it's all about the money, baby. Uh, it's the money, as Lebowski said. So you, you, you hit them where it hurts. You hit those banks in their wallet. They will be backing out of this pipeline faster than I could, than I could go down that hill, which isn't, which isn't fast, so they'll be faster than me. Now, now another question. Uh, you know, you had, the, you had the Democrats come out, uh, you know, so, uh, tw you know, four months late, as usual, saying, oh, I stand with Standing Rock, all this business. Well, where is the mobilization now against Donald Trump? I don't hear much mobilization among the, the leaders of our Democratic Party uh, right now to say, uh, Donald Trump, will you, we need you to come out verbally and forcefully now saying you will not be approving any permits once Energy Transfer Partners uh, re resubmits permits because that's their plan to basically resubmit the permits once Trump gets into office, which I believe is January 21st. So where, where is the mobilization now? Uh, I, if I'm not going to, I'm not going to call people to start uh, protesting. That's up to you. But we all know where Donald Trump lives. Trump Tower. He's going to be living in the White House. So there needs to be mobilization uh, starting now against Donald Trump, because Obama, the Army Corps, they might have done the right thing. But Donald Trump is a whole nother beast. And as we've seen. He's reportedly about to name uh, the CEO of Exxon Mobil to be his secretary of state, which is that's beyond the pale, even for Donald Trump. But the bottom line is, this is a man, the future president, uh, who loves himself oil. He loves big oil. He thinks that's the president. He thinks that's the future. He says climate change is a hoax. So as much mobilization has happened against Barack Obama, uh, the Army Corps, the um, the banks, you need to double that against Donald Trump. So that's the next part of this story. There's also um, stuff that's happening at camp. I'm not going to lie to you. There's a lot less to cover here. There's a lot less people here. It's not as fluid of a story at, at the current moment in Standing Rock to cover. You got to be more creative in finding things to cover. But uh, if you go to youtube.com slash TYT politics, you could see great interviews we did over the weekend. I interviewed uh, a gentleman named BJ Kidder, who is an, is an tribal elder now. But uh, the story he told me was heart wrenching. How, when he was five or six years old, uh, the U U.S. government flooded uh, flooded the land here. They forced him and his family to sleep out in a tent in freezing sub-zero temperatures here in North Dakota. They promised B.J. and his family uh, electricity, free housing. Of course, electricity and free housing never came. So it seems that broken promises from the U.S. government, that has not changed over the years. Um, so you could watch that. I also interviewed Chase Iron Eyes last night. Chase Iron Eyes is a leader here. He's a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. I interviewed him uh, weeks ago while he was running for Congress in North Dakota. Yesterday at the main Osheti Sakoi camp, I interviewed him because the day before, the sacred fire uh, was put out. Now, the sacred fire was an ongoing fire that was lit starting in July 
and went out two days ago here in um, here at Osheti Sakoi camp. So all the water protectors, people from around the country who have dedicated to the cause here were wondering, why did you put out the sacred fire? Are you saying that this fight is over? Uh, my understanding is the sacred fire in uh, Native American ceremony and ritual uh, eventually must go out. Uh, the reasons for one fire going out and another one starting, I can't really tell you. But this fire, uh, it was told to me, it was time for it to go out. And yesterday, Chase and uh, dozens of other water protectors, Native Americans and non-Natives, stood, stood by and uh, created a new sacred fire. We were there for that ceremony. We interviewed Chase uh, next to the new sacred fire and uh, spoke to Chase about the reasons he's staying, the reasons the other Native Americans are staying here, the reasons non-Natives are staying here. Again, they're not leaving until that drill pad is gone. And it's also bigger and mo uh, much bigger than just a pipeline. They're staying here because they, wa they want the discussion to continue about their sovereign land and their treaty rights, their land by treaty. They don't want this to just end with a pipeline. Again, this is their land via treaties in the 1851 and 1868. So they're staying here fighting for the Army Corps and the U.S. government to give them back their land. So it's about more than just fighting for the pipeline. But again, uh, at this moment, you probably have about a thousand people still here at the main Washeti Sakoi camp. Uh, technically, this is U.S. Army Corps land, so the Army Corps can evict them at any time if they want. But so far, the Army Corps has said they have to leave, but has not forcefully evicted anyone. Uh, but the temperatures are going to get colder, so it reason would stand there will be more people leaving. Uh, Chase did say in my interview with him that they do welcome new people, but only people who are self-sufficient, who have heated tents, who can come with their own wood, can come with their own propane, because they cannot uh, be responsible for any more people uh, than they are already responsible, which again is about a thousand people. I also want to move on before I finish to talking about uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline and the fight elsewhere. And you can see how cold it is by my nose, which looks like Clifford the Red Nose, Red Bit, <laughs> Clifford the Red Nose Dog. Uh, there, it's also Dakota Access Pipeline. The fight continues in Iowa as well as Illinois. Those are the two other states that this pipeline is going through. Uh, in Iowa on December 15th, so one, two, three days from now, at 8.30 in the morning, there will be um, a hearing at the Polk County Courthouse. I will put more information under this video. Uh, in Iowa, they are fighting the pipeline, which is basically completed there because like here, there was shocker, no, Im no environmental impact study and the in Iowa Utilities Board basically rammed it through. So you're going to have water protectors there. You're also going to have conservative landowners who are against this pipeline because their land is being seized by eminent domain. So this, pipe this pipeline brings together uh, liberal, progressive, and conservatives, uh, obviously for different reasons, but the conservatives that are going to be there are fighting against this pipeline because their land is being stolen and seized from them, all in the name of big oil. So December 15th, if you're in the Iowa area, it's in Des Moines at the Polk County Courthouse at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, the water protectors and the conservative landowners are going to be fighting against the pipeline on grounds that there was no environmental impact study and the conservative landowners were also not consulted about their land being seized. There's also still construction going on in Illinois. Um, I'm going to botch the pronunciation, but I think it's at the crossing of the Kaskaski River. Uh, I will put the information under the video for that too. But uh, the, the like you saw in Standing Rock, you have public police, the state police, are protecting the private oil company in Illinois. So the road uh, near this pipeline construction in Illinois is closed from four different uh, directions. So to get to that pipeline, you'd have to be Rambo. Like here, you'd have to be Rambo. So I'm going to put the information there. If you, if you live in the Illinois area or nearby, if you want to go there and try to protest, uh, you're welcome to. You'll have all the information for the Iowa and Illinois protests. Um, under the video once we put this up on youtube.com slash TYT politics. So the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline is not finished. Uh, here in Standing Rock, it has slowed down a little bit. Again, the camp is probably half the size of what it used to be. But again, three days from now, you have the fight in Illinois, uh, excuse me, in Iowa at the, at the Polk County Courthouse. Uh, where you'll have water protectors, conservative landowners, uh, you know, the Sierra Club. When you have the Sierra Club and conservatives coming together on one side, that's when you know you're on the right side of history. So the Sierra Club will be there. And I will also uh, 
we'll, we'll also be keeping you updated on the events in Iowa, on the events in Illinois. And uh, I am going back to New York for a few days tomorrow, but then I'm going to Texas to cover the Trans-Picos pipeline. The Trans-Picos pipeline uh, has been going, the construction's been going now for a year, and it's going from Texas down to, through Mexico. So I guess this is what Donald Trump was talking about when he said, we're not sending jobs to Mexico, we're keeping our jobs here. But they will send the oil to Mexico. So I will be going down to cover that because that story is very interesting because, again, it's conservative cowboys against this pipeline. It's not uh, African-Americans, Native Americans, although they're against the pipeline, too. The, the people most affected in Texas are conservatives. So I'm going to show you that side of the story. And um, I'm going to end with this. Uh, even This is my fifth time. I might be back in Standing Rock at some point. But if I'm not, I want to I tell you what I think. I think that, um, to me... Uh, you know, I'm not indigenous. I'm not African-American. I'm a white guy. I didn't grow up rich. I didn't grow up poor. I had it pretty decent. But uh, my white privilege, uh, whatever was left, is, is effectively gone. I mean, the stories I heard here, the people I spoke to, the, the horrors that I witnessed and heard from Native Americans, uh, you, really, you really learn as a white person that you don't have it so bad. I mean, we all have our problems. We all have our obstacles. A lot of our obstacles come from the government, the greed, the oligarchy we live in. But uh, what these Native Americans have been uh, forced to deal with in the last 300, 400 years, what they're still forced to deal with, it's horrific. It, no, no, no person, no group should be looked at as some subhuman. And no group or person should be treated as subhuman. And that's what the story of this pipeline is about.